Thank you very much. Uh, so first off, just to uh, acknowledge my co-authors, but especially uh, Lawrence Percival. Uh, this is based on his PhD work, and he also gave me an excellent introduction to the subject earlier on, based on his uh, postdoc work that's been ongoing. So I don't need to go through. This is some of the uh, some of the events. So mass extinctions, which are the subject of our, our meeting today, but also some of the lesser extinction events and oceanic and oxic events here through a section of, of the geological <coughs> record here. Um, and we've already uh, had an introduction to some of the potential causes of uh, these uh, these various events in the in the in the geological record. In fact. I think I even have the same picture here, Illustratia Anoxia, as one of the earlier speakers. So that clearly means that Google Images is <laughs> the top hit. So uh, dead fish are all the rage today. Um, but uh, but I, so I won't I won't talk through these individually. But just to say that one of the uh, one of the, the the key triggers that have been proposed is volcanism, and more specifically, large igneous province volcanism. And the reason for this should be relatively obvious in terms of these. These, these warm and uh, uh, these blue and orange bars here illustrate the, the evidence of volcanism in the record. And you can see more than, a, uh, more than a passing coincidence between these episodes and episodes of volcanism. So one of the things that we'd really, really like is a mark of volcanism in the actual sediments that record <coughs> these, these very events here. And that's just been highlighted beautifully, actually, by the last question in the, from the previous speaker about those, date, those, those dates from lavas. So you take a block of lava and you date it, you can get pretty big error bars. We're doing ever better job on that, but you can get pretty big error bars. And so trying to actually correlate that with a specific uh, episode in the geological record could be really tricky. So what we'd like is a fingerprint of volcanism in the geological record itself. Um, and this is where mercury may come in. So I'm actually a volcanologist by, by trade, by training, uh, and I got into this really by sitting in volcanic plumes here and uh, measuring mercury coming out of present-day volcanoes. Uh, and mercury is, um, mercury is uh, an unusual substance. I mean, it's, you know, you, so those of you who were able to use mercury thermometers at school might remember some bubbles of mercury running around the lab when you broke them. Great fun. Turns out to be really dangerous. Um, and um, and, uh, and so, so it's an unusual substance, a liquid at room temperature, and it also, it also uh, vaporises. So coming out, and this is a, a picture from Nicaragua, from Messiah Volcano, there's actually gaseous mercury coming out of this volcano here. And the reason that's important for, for us in this context is that means it has a much longer atmospheric lifetime. It has an atmospheric lifetime of uh, six months to two years, as opposed to most volcanic metals that go into the particle phase and fall out in a matter of days and weeks. So this means that mercury can get well distributed in our atmosphere. And that's what I started off worrying about. And then through Lawrence's uh, master's project and PhD work, we started worrying a lot more about how it got into the sediments. And the reason that we started worrying about that was because of uh, this, uh, this work here by uh, Hamid Sanai and Graspi and others at the M Permian that showed this, this beautiful spike of mercury that they used as evidence to link it to the Siberian traps. And since that very seminal work, there's been a lot of other studies here uh, basically using mercury. So we're beginning to build up an understanding of how this proxy may or may not work. Lawrence highlighted some of the problems earlier in his talk, uh, going back further in the geological record. I'm going to show you some records where it does work quite well, but I think my take-home message, which I'll put up right up front to you now, is that it's showing a lot of promise, but there's still lots of problems that we really need to understand to make this, uh, to really understand whether this is a unique proxy and a reliable proxy for volcanism. Um, but this is just an illustration, really, of the sort of key parts of that cycle. So terrestrial organic matter is important, Organic matter in the oceans is important, and also sulfides may well be important. Um, so the two periods I'm going to look at are the N-Triassic and then the, um, the Toarcian as well. So the N-Triassic is linked to this, uh, the camp volcanism, the central Atlantic magmatic province, uh, and of course also linked to a really major mass extinction event, one of the so-called Big Five. Um, the Toarcian is uh, an oceanic anoxic event, and is linked to this, this high-latitude Karoo Farah igneous province here. Um, in the interest of staying in, coral in time order, I'm going to start with the N-Triassic, although we actually did the Toarcian work first. Um, 
And what I have here is a, some, very, some sections. And one of the things that's very important, I think, when you're looking for mercury signals is not just to base it on one section, but to look at lots of sections around the globe because you have various different things that it varies with. So we've got sections here from St. Audrey's Bay, which is up here um, in the UK, uh, and then various sections around the world. And we try and get uh, sections in different hemispheres as well in order to understand the differences there. So we've got Arroyo Marlow here down in South America. Um, and we've got the carbon isotope excursions here in the green. And then what I have is mercury normalised to total organic carbon. So you remember that's very important because the mercury tends to bind to the organic carbon. So we need to normalise it to that uh, to, uh, to basically mitigate against just having a higher flux rate of organic carbon taking your, carbon, uh, your mercury down. Um, we can correlate between the different sections here, the end Triassic extinction marked here, relatively well. The TJB, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, is a little bit more difficult to correlate. But what we can see, and these are all put on the same scale, just to highlight to you the, the excursions here, so we can actually see in all four of these, these cores, uh, the end Triassic extinction has a mercury pulse associated with it. Um, this record here actually is a good record. If we'd rescaled it, it would show up even better. But one of the complexities with mercury is if you have high variations in total organic carbon, it can actually mask that signal. So the first thing to notice is this spike on the end Triassic extinction in all of these. And the very nice thing about the end Triassic, which in many ways made this the sort of uh, a key place to go look for a mercury signal, is that we can actually correlate the flows of the camp very specifically with the, uh, with the chronology here. And that's because we have overlap in Morocco and North America. This is a composite section here between some of the ca actual camp flows uh, and, the, and the, uh, the stratigraphic record. So what was really exciting for us about this was to be able to mark the end Triassic extinction here, see this pulse of the mercury, and almost, if you like, put our finger on the, the, uh, the, the, the lower high atlas flow here that actually, um, that actually uh, we could argue accounts for this mercury spike here. And the other thing we could then see was also to look in this period between the uh, end Triassic extinction and the, uh, the, the boundary and see further spikiness here. And what this was suggesting to us is that, uh, as confirmed by, uh, by these, these two records, was that we actually have a very pulsed nature on a whole province-wide uh, scale in terms, of the, uh, in terms of the emplacement of camp. Um, and uh, Lawrence uh, further like, looked at other records to correlate with these. And so there were interesting things we could do. So here we can sort of follow through. This is... Uh, this is one on this, this, uh, this, this, this is the basaltic strat log again. Uh, this is one here, which is coincident with the, ET, the, the, the extinction, which we can then correlate through. Uh, and this is the, the new section here with some of the other uh, basaltic flows within it. And we can correlate that with pulses in CO2 as well, as measured um, in different, <coughs> different indicators here. So you can try and put together different lines of evidence to say, here we have the, the volcanism going off in a big pulse. It's recorded in the mercury, and it's also recorded in the atmospheric CO2, which, was a, a, which, which this great stratigraphy at camp actually allowed us to do in a way that's more difficult or more challenging to do uh, at other events. So if we go forward in time a little bit now into the mid-Jurassic, uh, looking at the Tuarcian, and I just to remind you, so here we have, this will be important in a second, we have a high latitude lip being in place here, the Karoo Farah, which now outcrops in South Africa. Um, again, we try to put together a global, uh, a global capture, if you like, looking for the mercury in this signal. Uh, you can see that the record in the southern hemisphere is a little sparse compared to the uh, European sections. Um, but so, uh, so again, we're putting here, so here we have the, the Plinsbachian and Tuarcian boundary, and here's the oceanic and oxic event. So this is the carbon isotope anomaly here. Um, associated with that. Um, and this, again, is the mercury normalised to total organic carbon. And so to just to draw out a few things here, we were, we were encouraged to see uh, some coherence between the different sections. So four of the different sections, we saw a very nice mercury excursion associated with the, uh, with the Toasian OAE. Uh, so this was... This was, this was the first sort of global extent of a global attempt to correlate these spikes and gave us an idea that this was actually a good global proxy in terms of looking uh, for volcanism. 
Um, but there was also some complexity. So you can see that at the, uh, in the Yorkshire section and in, the, in uh, Sancerre in France, we didn't actually have any mercury excursion here. Um, and part of the problem with that is that both of these sections, you get a, a huge enhancement in total organic carbon during the OAE, which you may expect. And that actually, although we had a signal in the mercury here, that excursion there masked it. So we cannot be sure that that is volcanic mercury. It could just be mercury being taken down from the background environment into the sediments themselves. Uh, so, I'm sorry. And also at, uh, in Croatia here, at Velibit, we didn't actually have any organic carbon. Um, and this is something that Lawrence again alluded to earlier. So we didn't have a signal there, but we're not sure if that's because there was no mercury in the environment or there was just no nothing to take it down and hold it in the sediments. So the sedimentary chemistry is really important here. The other thing that really interested us was this, this peak here in, um, in mercury at the, uh, to our, the Plinsbachian and Tuarcian boundary as well. And it's especially visible in Mokras in Wales um, and, uh, and in Panache in Portugal as well. Uh, and people had suggested before, so this is just a, again, this is a, show, uh, illustrating, if you like, the kind of uncertainty of the dating. So this is a probability density curve uh, of, the, of the dating of the Karoo for our igneous province. Um, and you can see that it's been suggested that you get these pulses of volcanism from the dates themselves. And these are some of these sort of extinction pulses, although it's a, a relatively minor extinction pulse in terms of what, uh, what people are talking about today. Uh, but this extra pulse in mercury here suggested to us this could be evidence for a, uh, the, a pulsed, uh, the pulsed nature of the Karoo for our, for our igneous, uh, large igneous province. Or alternatively, uh, different intrusions. We know that the, uh, the Karoo Farrar intrudes cold beds at times during its history. So it could be that what we're seeing here is a period where it intrudes a lot of cold beds, volatilizing a lot more mercury and carbon from, um, from, the, igneous from, from the, the crust that it's intruding through here and here. And the volcanism could be more continuous, but not actually intruding these different lithologies. There's two different arguments that we can make there. So to try and explore this a bit further, um, we put this together with osmium, osmium isotopes. And Lawrence, again, has uh, introduced this, as, this earlier on. And the thing to notice is that the province is right down here. So whereas you'd actually expect osmium isotopes to go that way if you've got volcanism being <coughs> put, put in here, we actually saw them go in the opposite direction, which is true in other sections as well. And the argument we make for that is because actually what you're seeing is a weathering flux. Uh, for subaerial volcanism rather than actually a direct measure of volcanism. So although the province is down here, the main weathering is happening in the, in the, in the wetter uh, tropical area here, and so it's pulling it in this direction rather than that direction. But if we put these proxies together, we can see quite a nice uh, uh, potential story uh, coming together here. We have a carbon isotope dip here at the Plunsbachian and Tuarcian boundary, a spike in the mercury, and also, a, um, and also a change in the osmium, so increase in weathering. So carbon cycle due to volcanism, increasing in weathering. And the same story played out in the Tuarcian OE and then a recovery afterwards. So we can make that argument using those different proxies that we're seeing the way the environment is behaving. So my final slide, um, and just to draw together, and this is really just an advertisement for some work that's in progress, um, which is the sort of final chapter of Lawrence's PhD, what we really want to do now is to draw together the lessons from all these different studies that we're doing and actually hopefully do some uh, experiments and measurements in between these studies as well to really understand the proxy. Um, and we're trying to sort of put things together um, in terms of thinking about the sort of the, the nature of the signals, the volume of the provinces, but also the type of province, whether you have submarine and what sort of rocks you're intruding. Uh, so there's a lot of different factors we need to really understand what's going on. And there's also sedimentary factors in terms of the preservation we need to understand too. I'll leave my conclusions up and there's some gratuitous volcano photos for anyone who's interested. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tanzin. One quick question. Yep. I noticed the uh, reference several times to Kujok, the GSSP for the Bayes Etangen. Um, I've always been a bit concerned about that um, because of the uh, rather disjointed nature of some of the sections it was based upon. And there's a very recent publication which is analysing the structural complexity of that area, which throws 
doubt onto the really the validity of that site for a GSSP. I don't know whether you know about that. We, we certainly had some. We this is why we only tried to really <coughs> correlate the extinction event. Yes. So we certainly had some concerns over that. Yeah. Well, the, the uh, uh, Spencer Lucas, who you may have heard of, was quite uh, forthright in his view of that GSSP. He said it was political rather than scientific in nature. Right. Um, um, well, I, I, I couldn't be as forthright. I, I, as I had another proposal, and I was convener of the working group at that time. But I, I would uh, echo his feelings now. I, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to get involved in politics <laughs> um, <laughs> for many reasons. But um, uh, I, I guess that's why another reason why looking at multiple sections is always very important, because mm. different sections can be uh, open to reinterpretation uh, to, uh, and different sections to different extents as well. Mm. well that was based upon, uh, predicated upon the first appearance of a salicerated ammonite. Now, the uh, earlier proposal of the, f of the first salicerated ammonite, Salacerus planorbis, or even Salacerus erogatum, which were a little younger than Spele, they were poo-pooed in their turn, but now we have, again, back to the first salicerated ammonite, Salus Spele. Le leave my, uh, I rest my case. Okay, thanks for that.